welcome to Refuge Community Church's online service. My name is Sean Siglin, and I'm one of the pastors here. We exist to glorify God by making disciples to shape our communities with the love of Jesus. Before we get started with our worship service, we have just a few quick announcements. As many of you know, when we are able to start meeting together, we will be meeting in Rodriguez Elementary School. And so we want to start loving them well now. As you may have seen from the email sent out on Friday, there are a few actual material needs that we are able to meet. Right now, we're able to pick up food, donate products, and finances. If that's something you're interested in, please reach out to us today. Next, we have our weekly prayer. Every Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., we will be praying for the different topics that were sent out earlier in the day. Lastly, we have community groups. During this time of social distancing, we're trying to encourage everybody to be as connected as possible. If you haven't joined a community group yet, you can do that by checking out the link in the description of this video. Now, let's go ahead and get ready to worship.
times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond. from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 in the ESV. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
and they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food, with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Please pray with me. Dear Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, the gift of this church, being able to fellowship together this morning. I pray that you would um, be with Josh and that you would guide his words to open your scriptures to our hearts and to our, uh, to our eyes. Um, thank you again for all the blessings that you've given us in this time. In your son's name, amen. Good morning. Hey, my name is Josh. If this is your first time uh, with us, uh, my name uh, is Josh. <laughs> my name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here at Refuge. Uh, Refuge is a new church in South and Southeast Austin. Uh, we're hoping uh, to launch later this year, obviously dependent on some of how the, the COVID situation uh, kind of unfolds. But uh, thank you for joining us, man. Uh, we would love to know who you are and the fact that you're with us, spending time with us. And so I encourage you jump back into the video description. Um, really uh, click the connections page. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked. Uh, click the connections page, fill out some of that information. Uh, we'd love to know just a little bit more about you. In addition, uh, we'd love to know how we can serve you and pray for you right now, especially during this COVID season. Um, and so, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. For the rest of you guys, I know that y'all are y'all are home. Y'all are with us. You know me. And you know that we're fixing to get into the Word. This is like my favorite time ever. And we're going to be uh, really moving forward in our series, Acts, a Movement for the Modern World. Today, we're actually going to be finishing up Acts chapter 2 and seeing how this new, uh, these new spirit-filled and empowered followers of Jesus are starting to form the first Christian community. And I'm excited because it, this text, although short, really gives us a, a front row seat to see the values and priorities of this new Christian community. And how appropriate a text right now, man, because obviously we all feel the weight of missing community. Right. We, we, we can't meet with each other. We can't see each other. We're, we're still doing social isolation. So it's sad and we're frustrated. And we're longing for community. But the, the danger to that is actually that if we jump back into community, OK, and, and we take with us the values and priorities of our culture, right, the, the American culture, the Austin culture, whatever it may be, and, and instead of taking the culture and the values, the priorities of scripture into community, we're going to end up experiencing uh, discouraging um, community instead of empowering and life-giving community. It's going to be dissatisfying. Uh, because if you haven't noticed, uh, America, with all of its individualism and, and as, much as, as much good as that has brought, when it comes to community and relationships, America is a pretty lonely place, man. Like, like they're pretty poor values. Uh, according to the National Review, since 1980, the percentage of American adults who would say they feel lonely has gone from 20% up to 40%. Uh, the American Sociological Review uh, says the average U.S. citizen uh, has only one close friend. Uh, and, and one in four would say they have no one to confide in at all. To make matters worse, okay, an overwhelming 75% of American adults would say they are dissatisfied in their current friendship. So apparently that one friend isn't even a good friend. He's apparently a poor friend. And this sense of loneliness that we have as a culture, man, it, it actually is detrimental to our health. The chronic feeling of loneliness um, is reported to possibly have the same impact on our health as 15 cigarettes a day. That's how bad, like if you want any more evidence, okay, that God created us to be in community and in relationship with other people, that it is not good for man to be alone, man, that's it right there. And for some of us, we see these stats and we're like, wow, that's sad. And we don't relate to them. Maybe you have a bustling social life. Probably not right now, but, but, may, but maybe you are at least like engaging with other people and it's a regular part of your life. Others of us, I know that many of us see these, these statistics and man, we relate to them. We relate to them deeply. We feel the loneliness that these numbers try, try to communicate. We don't really need these numbers to tell us what that is about because we feel it on a personal level. And so many of us that are there, if not all of us, man, we want to change. It's like, like we want the relationship and community rut that we feel ourselves stuck in to change. But, but oftentimes we just don't know how. With that in mind, today's sermon is actually called Compelling Community. Because Acts is going to show us what community, empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
and prioritizing the word of God looks like. Well, at the same time, it's going to really compel us to, to look at some of the steps that, that these people have taken to really form this community. And it, it, I really do believe it's compelling us to take those same steps in order to start building relationships and community like this. And so for the sake of time, I want to go ahead and jump in. We are in, sorry, I got a little congestion working. Uh, we're going to be in Acts 2, 42 through 47. A little bit of context uh, to pick up where we were, uh, to where we left off last week. Uh, and then Peter, newly empowered by the Holy Spirit, preached his first sermon. Uh, in verse 41 of Acts 2, we learned that the word of God went out, the gospel went out from Peter's mouth, and 3,000 people came to faith. 3,000 individuals were saved. But they didn't say individuals for long, because in the very next section of text, all right, the scriptures, Acts starts referring to them not as people or individuals, but as a people, as a single people, right, a, a group. And that's important for us to, to, to really see, because as Americans, we have the temptation uh, to look at scripture uh, with an individualistic perspective. Okay, what does it mean for me or for you or for him, whatever the case is? But what the scriptures here are showing us is that the gospel may save us as individuals. It has a personal redemption, but it does not leave us as individuals. In other words, the gospel, the word of God, saves a person in order to form a people. Hear me again. The gospel saves a person in order to form a people. You were saved in order to become a part of a bigger community. You weren't saved to hold the, 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 the love, affection that you feel to yourself, but rather to express it and to experience it even more in the context of more people. Look at Titus 2.14. Where it says he, that's Jesus, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. And this people, the people of God, collectively bear specific characteristics, right? All together, they share in activities and in goals that really mark them as being a part of that community of God. And here in Acts 2, uh, Luke is starting, Luke is the, act, the, the author of Acts, uh, he's starting to paint this picture of what those characteristics are, what they look like. Um, he's not showing us all of them. There's going to be other pictures. Uh, but, but this is kind of like, like the first introductory course of, of what the church looks like. And it's critical that we grab it uh, and, and really grab how it happens because he really does explain how it happens as well. Uh, but, but to really help us understand the text and to work through it well today, I, I want to try to summarize it in three points. And those points are, one, that this was a community in the Word. Okay, this was a community in the Word. Two, that this was a community in fellowship. A community in fellowship. And three, that this was a community on mission. Okay, uh, so those are the three points that we're going to try to use to navigate through this, this well, learn uh, who these people were and how they came to be here. Um, and so really what I want to do is go ahead and jump into our first point in the word. And, and to give you a heads up, we're really going to be parked here for a while. Uh, you're going to see why at the end, but we're going to be parked here. But I want to go ahead and jump in to understanding how they were a community in the word. Verse 42 starts describing this new community like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. Okay, so what is the apostles teaching? Well, the apostles teaching is Jesus teaching passed down uh, to the apostles. Uh, and we have that same teaching passed down through the word, through the scriptures. Okay, instead of a, a, a oral tradition where they're, they're sharing stories, it's now been collected in writings and passed down. And we now have that same teaching in our hands when we open the Bible. And so it's safe for you when you read the apostles' teachings to go ahead and, and put in a word like scripture or the word, right? The word of God meaning the Bible. Uh, and, and so we have this same word with us. Uh, and having said that, what I want you to take notice of uh, and what I hope you see to right now is how important the word stayed to these new believers. Meaning they weren't a people that came to faith through the word and then left the word back there where they got saved. They brought it into their, their, their today life. Right? It, was, it, it, it stayed and maintained its place as a critical uh, uh, part to their life and existence. It was really the source of this new community. In fact, 
Theologians almost universally agree and believe that this was the first description of this new community of faith, really the first description of the, the, the modern New Testament church, because this is really the source of how they built the vibrant, uh, loving community uh, to, to be devoted to Scripture, okay? What does that mean? Why, how so? Well, you're looking at a people here who have and are still wrestling with their brokenness and fear and shame. They're submitting it to Christ and they're really walking in forgiveness. Okay, like, like, like even in verse 43, think about it like this. In verse 43, it says that they're filled with awe. Uh, and it's paired with the apostles' miracles. But notice that it's not because of the apostles' miracles. The apostles' miracles are reinforcing the awe that's present. And the awe is coming from the transforming work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles' teachings. Right? So the apostles are teaching and it's getting into the heart of these people and their lives are being transformed. Right? And, and, and this is filling everybody with awe. And the reason is because when we engage Scripture with an open heart, when we sincerely ask God to change us, he does the awe-inspiring work of, of beginning the process of transformation, right? Like, like he begins to, to, to change us. A lot of people went from one day to the next, one day not believing in Jesus, the next day believing in Jesus. One day, like maybe some of them were living individualistically, and the next day they're living in hardcore community, right? One day they were stingy, and the next day they were generous. The, the word began to, to pierce their hearts and drew them uh, to change. We're looking at a people, the way this happened, I should say, is that we're looking at a people that as they submitted themselves to the word, uh, they learned teachings in scripture and that teaching started to transform their mind. Let's think of a couple of examples, right? Like, like they probably learned about their adoption into God's family and that helped them see other people as brothers and sisters, not just like-minded people, right? They probably learned about their freedom from bondage, uh, the bondage of sin and death. And that probably helped them work against things like greed and selfishness that, that threatened to tear communities apart. They probably learned about Christ's grace that really frees them from the fear of judgment. And that probably helped them a fight against the fear of rejection, the fear of rejection that oftentimes enters our hearts when we're entering into community and relationship. Uh, these are people that can look at each other and say, hey, because I have done the hard work uh, of really looking at the word of God and inviting it to change me, uh, I'm going to give to you without the expectation that you would really give me anything back. Uh, this work of submitting uh, ourselves to the scriptures, uh, to the mirror of the scriptures, uh, which is really when the scripture paints a picture of you that just makes you uncomfortable because you're like, dang, that's true, but it's uncomfortable. Uh, that, that submission to the mirror of scripture and allowing it, inviting it to shape our, our hearts, our minds, our lives, really is the source of this new, vibrant, loving community. And so when I read this, one of the things that, that I'm convinced of, really, is, is that, friends, man, oftentimes we don't have the community we desire because we're oftentimes not allowing our hearts to be transformed by the Word of God. And I know that sounds strong, but I, I just want you to hear me out. Oftentimes we aren't devoting ourselves to the Scriptures to the extent that when, when, they, when they confront the habits and routines of our life that are unhealthy, ungodly, that bring disunity, that hurt others. Uh, man, we're not sincerely asking God, God, change these. Like, 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 change them, please. And we look at texts like this and we expect and desire the same results this community had without really making the same sacrifices this community made. And, and I get it, man. I really do. Like, to read scripture this way is difficult. It's hard. To consistently be looking at scripture and saying, hey, God, change me. Please, Lord, change me. It can oftentimes feel like we're highlighting our failures instead of celebrating victories. Uh, and, and, and man, that's horrible. That's almost downright, you know, depressing in some ways. Uh, you, you know, and I get it. Oftentimes it's this perspective when, when talking about scripture and when we preach uh, in, in Christian churches uh, that can make the transforming power of God pretty unappealing, if not like really downright offensive. Uh, but, but friends, I would, I would contend that it doesn't have to feel that way. Uh, I'm convinced that oftentimes we don't invite God to transform us by his word because we don't engage the word through the lens of the gospel. I'm going to say that again because I want us to catch this. I'm convinced oftentimes we don't invite God to transform us by his word because we don't engage the word through the lens of the gospel. 
And then I'm the first to do this. I approach the word and I say, you know, what are you going to tell me about me? Like, like, give me something out of it. I, I approach it, if I'm being honest, I approach it selfishly with a very self-centered approach and, and perspective. And then I'm hurt when the, when, when the scriptures turn around and they're like, man, what I have to say about you, Josh, is that outside of Jesus, without Jesus, you're kind of garbage. I'm like, no, no, don't tell me that. Um, but that's not the intention of scripture. That's not, the intention of scripture is not, is not, its primary intention is not to tell us that we're garbage. Why? Well, because we oftentimes forget that scripture is written to us, or scripture is written for us, but it's not written about us. Let's say that again. Scripture is written uh, for us, but it's not written about us, at least not primarily. So check this out. When we fall into the trap of believing Scripture is written about us, we begin to see the Scriptures as something that's only meant to really tell us how to live. If you've been in Christianity for any extended period of time, you probably know the saying that the Bible is uh, the basic instructions before leaving earth. Right? This idea that, that man, this is the thing that should show us how to live our lives. And yes, scripture shows us what a God-glorifying life looks like. But man, if that's the primary way we read the Bible, if that's the primary way we engage scripture, then of course, the main thing that we're going to feel is scripture's curses laid on us as we realize that we have not lived up to the standard that this book is preaching and telling us about. Uh, we may have had moments, but, but none of us has, have aced this test. As, as author and Pastor Paul Tripp puts it, none of us are grace graduates. Uh, if this book was written about me, then it can only tell me where I failed at living a holy life. Uh, I, I love the way the great reformer Martin Luther, he was really the one that started uh, the Reformation roughly 500 years ago. So this is a, at least, if not all, like this is, this is a minimum of 500-year-old truth, but it's really 2,000 years old because it's in Scripture. But, but he said it like this. Once you are in Christ, the law, that is the word, is the greatest guide for your life. But until you have Christian righteousness, all the law can do is show you how sinful and condemned you are. And so, friends, it is a burden when we approach Scripture saying this is about me. But rather, we should approach it by understanding that it is written for us, not about us. How is it written for us? Well, it's written for us because it's written about someone else. It's written about Jesus. That's how it's written for us. You see, Scripture is written to point us to the greater truth of who Jesus is, of who he is, of his life and his glory. And if the apostles' teaching is truly Jesus' teaching, then, then that's really what it is. It's about him. Think about Luke 24 as an example. In Luke 24, a resurrected Jesus sees two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus is just a region, a city. Um, and he asked them what they're talking about. And they're like, man, have you been living under a rock, man? Like Jesus uh, has been crucified in Jerusalem. And check out his response in verse 25. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. All the scriptures are about Jesus, not just starting at Matthew to Revelation, not just the New Testament, everything in the Old Testament. It all is meant to point us to the glory and splendor and majesty and grace and patience and awesomeness of Jesus. And, and this means that, that, that when we engage scripture, it is meant to point us to, to, the, to the truth of Jesus' victory, not the reality of our failure. Right, right? When we engage scripture through the lens of the gospel, we're able to see Jesus' perfect life uh, exchange for ours, the sinner's life, so that we could be made righteous. When we see moments of failure, we're meant to be reminded of Jesus' perfect life, not our imperfect life. It's meant to point us to his mercy, his grace, his perfection, to, to really encourage and bring life to our heart as we see his beauty, as we see his majesty. And not just that, because the beauty of the gospel is not that we simply see, oh, we're forgiven. And then we go, OK, man, well, I guess I'm forgiven. I got to I got to I got to just continuously move on and feel powerless. But rather, this whole chapter, chapter two, is about how Jesus in his resurrection forgives us and then empowers us with his spirit. Right. Because of the gospel, then we've been given the same spirit that provides life and holiness to Jesus. We've received the Holy Spirit as followers of Jesus. 
And as a result, we now read scripture as the promise of where we're going, not the reminder of where we've been. We read scripture as the promise of how the, the Lord is working in us, what he's taking us to, how he's transforming us, what he's transforming us into, rather than a reminder of the failures that we've experienced in our past. So as a couple of examples, right? When, when now, through the gospel, when we read a scripture like love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew and really all the gospels, I can, um, I can now, for one, remember that I am forgiven by Jesus, by God through Jesus because of the cross uh, for the moments where I have not loved my neighbor well. But two, I also pray and ask God to transform my heart, my mind, uh, that was the opposite, but to transform my, my heart and my mind so that I can begin to love my neighbor as myself. Okay, when I read a verse like carry one another's burdens in Galatians 6, right, right, I, I, I one, think about the fact and the reality that I'm forgiven for the times where I have not carried my, my brother's sister's burdens well at all. And then I, number two, likewise, I pray and ask God to transform my heart and mind so that I can carry my brother and sister burdens well in the future. Man, it's this powerful gospel, friends. It's, it's submission to the word through, through the power of the spirit working in our lives, reminding us of Jesus' forgiveness, grace, and mercy that really free these people, right? Really free this community to live out a powerful community, to, to, to form a loving, forgiving, vibrant, appealing, attractive community. I'm convinced, friends, that the first step to creating true community is not inviting someone into your home. It's inviting the word into your heart. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reminded in this uh, section about um, the celebration of Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth, uh, for those of you that, that, that maybe aren't familiar with it, is the celebration of when the Emancipation Proclamation was declared here in Texas. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation was actually put into effect in 1863, but because of how far Texas was, uh, as of up until 1865, there were an estimated 250,000 uh, freed African Americans still living in slavery. It wasn't until uh, June 19th when Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and, and read aloud the words, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Uh, friends, oftentimes we live in the bondage of things like fear, uh, of rejection, things like um, the fear of judgment. We live in the bondage of sin, like, like selfishness and greed and self-centeredness. And it really stops us from building true and meaningful community. Yet it's actually the word of God in the lens of the gospel, having received Jesus, having followed him, that the word now steps in and declares, but no, no, you're free from that. You're free from that. In our text today, it's from this place of freedom, being in the word, working out the freedom uh, from the fear of rejection, judgment, or failure, uh, that they're now able to, to truly live in fellowship in a healthy way. Uh, and so it's really because of the, the, the characteristic that they're in the word that we're now able to even consider the reality that they were in fellowship. Yeah, let's go ahead and look at that. And, and real quick, Stay with me here, because I told you we're going to spend most of our time on the in the word piece, which means we're going to blast through these last two. So, so please stay, stay, uh, stay aware, stay up. Um, man, Acts 2, 44 through 47 read, Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Okay, so, so having been transformed by the word, or maybe not even having been, because remember, this is a progressive thing. So, so, so in the having the disposition of submitting themselves to the word, right, still wrestling with uh, the reality of their uh, sinfulness, but, but experiencing and pursuing forgiveness in the gospel, 
These people come together. They're vulnerable with each other. They, 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 they spend time together. They enjoy together. They invite each other into their mess. This is, it forms this community of love and compassion and grace and, and camaraderie. It's amazing. And you think people didn't struggle here? Like, like people were still struggling. I, I can guarantee it. Like, like, there was someone upset that someone else ate too much food and, and this other person didn't have enough to eat. That happened. In fact, we're going to read about it in just a couple of chapters. But, man, being freed by the gospel, they were able to sell their possessions, right, uh, and be generous and know they'd still be provided for. Because they'd been freed by the gospel, they were able uh, 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 to, to see what brought them together instead of the things that separated them, right? They had all things in common. Because they were freed by the gospel, they were able to look at each other and know, hey man, this is me, and this is you, and we're broken and messed up, but, but we are seeking forgiveness. We submit ourselves to the word, and we're forgiven, and, and, and we share the common goal of seeing the other walk in that forgiveness, to walk in that newness of life, and to see others outside of this community come to know that newness of life as well. And it, it's this environment that created a beautiful and powerful community, something that was attractive and appealing to people, right? The fact that they walked praising God and they enjoyed the favor of all people. Uh, N.T. Wright is a professor and theologian, and about this section, he says, he, he puts it like this, when Jesus followers behave like this, they find, uh, uh, they sometimes find, to their surprise, that they have a new spring in their step, there is an attractiveness, an energy about a, a life in which we stop clinging on to everything we can. We can get and start sharing it, giving it away, celebrating God's generosity by being generous ourselves. And that attractiveness is one of the things that draws other people in. Uh, man, friends, it's in this context of, of, of this fellowship that, that we see they, they, they are doing it healthily, they're encouraging, but they also create and form an appealing community. Something that, that is noticeably different and that is appealing to the people outside. And, and it's really in this context of fellowship that they are now empowered uh, to really live out this last characteristic, which is the fact that they are on mission. Verse 47, the last part of it reads, um, Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Okay, now, as they built this appealing and beautiful community, uh, people started engaging it, started being interested in it. And yes, the Lord added to their number, but the entire book of Acts is really showing us how God is at work in the world through his people. And so that means that it's safe to assume these people went out and actually started inviting others into a relationship with Jesus. And that relationship with Jesus, obviously, as we've discussed for the past like 25 minutes, uh, starts to shape and form them into a greater community of people that are following Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, friends, that, that, man, when you enter into community, like what we're doing here as a church, like we are absolutely planting a church to see people come to faith. I hope and pray, and I pray often over uh, South Austin, Southeast Austin, that we would see people radically change, right? Our, our mission statement, right, is to make disciples that shape uh, their communities with the gospel of Jesus. Man, that's our desire and our passion, our goal as a community. But when you go out to see that happen, when you take the practical steps of inviting someone to church, praying for somebody, sharing the gospel, I, I want to encourage you, you are not alone in that. Rather, we are called as a community to uplift each other, to join in together, to encourage one another. And so those moments when you want to pray for someone and see their life transform, see encouragement come to them, and maybe they're a little hesitant. Maybe they even like rejected you. Maybe you invited someone to church and they were like, no, nah, I'm good, man. Like, like the beautiful part in this team effort is that you were able to come back and see somebody encouraging you. Hey, man, I'm going to pray for you. Remember the truth that you are uh, loved, a son, a daughter of God. Remember that you were forgiven. Remember that you are accepted. It's the beauty that this community doesn't do mission alone, but still does mission together. Spreading the kingdom was never meant to be a solo effort, but a team effort. You're part of a team, family. Um, and this is, this is the community of faith painted in Acts 2. Uh, it, it's fun. It's encouraging. Uh, but, but I think the biggest thing I want you to take away from this reality, that this community that was in the Word and Fellowship on Mission, um, is that, that notice that everything we talked about right now 
was not super Christians coming together to make super community. We read a text like this and we see these characteristics. We see this environment. We see these dynamics and we think, gosh, I want that. Like, that sounds amazing. How can I get that? How can I work toward that? Man, friends, it's not about you going and being perfect and then coming back and creating a perfect community with other people. This community was built on on, on the vulnerability, the brokenness uh, and the fear, all the, the negative things that we think we should hide and get out before and not show anybody else this community was built on people bringing those things into a community and building this dependence on Jesus his grace forgiveness love acceptance man that's what this community was built on it's not something that's reserved for the spiritual elite in fact it's something that's reserved for the spiritually broken it's something that only happens when we're able to come in and go, man, guys, I love you. I need Jesus. I hope you do too. Let's get together and try to follow him. Let's get together and remind each other of his grace and mercy. Let's get together and spur each other toward love and good deeds. Let's get together and let iron sharpen iron. That's where this community thrives and is built. And so it's my prayer that you would, you would take this reality into the community that you want to build and into the community that we collectively want to build here at Refuge. Right As we close today, my prayer is that you would see this deep dependence, this, this, this gospel-infused community right, that, that's vibrant and loving, that you would say, you know what, uh, that's, what that's what I want. I, I, I want to be a part of by, as in contribute and experience the gospel through a group of people and, and to really dedicate yourself to that, to give yourself to that, not to give yourself to forming a perfect community, not to give yourself to waiting for a perfect community, but rather to give yourself to a broken community that is depending upon the grace and mercy of Jesus and it's Jesus' grace and mercy that, is, that are working in our hearts and making us perfect. And so as we close up today, I have a couple of ways to encourage you to, to really practically do that this week. Okay, the first way is I, I want to encourage you to pray scripture. Again, this started through the devotion of these believers to the word together. Uh, now, now, that also happened on an individual basis. So, so they engage the word together, but they also engage the word by themselves. And so in your own life, I want to encourage you, pray through the scriptures. What does that mean? It means that when you uh, really engage a text that confronts all the, uh, in your life, where you're just like, oh, I feel so naked. <laughs> That you wouldn't be like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close this and push it aside. That you would, you would, you would deal with it, right? That you would deal with it. Uh, that you would take it before God. That you would, you would uh, pray that scripture over yourself. And, and that prayer should probably have a, a few things. It should probably have, one, some thanksgiving. Uh, two, some confession and repentance. And then three, some worship, right? That, that you would be able to take that text before God, give him thanks that he has even written his word to you, that he has sent out a reminder of the goodness of Jesus and his character and the glory of the Son. And then from there, confess that you, your life doesn't look like that. Uh, confess and, and then believe that you are forgiven and then worship and praise him for that forgiveness while also asking him to empower you to obedience. And the second thing, friends, is to commit to attending a community group this week. Uh, I think that is a huge one. Uh, if I'm being honest, um, just li look at a, a list of, of, of descriptions of the text we just read. They were people who were in the Word together, spending time together, breaking bread together, praying for each other, being generous. I mean, like 90% of that happens when we actually get into community during community groups. And when I say commit to going to a community group, I don't mean commit to like showing up and being like, all right, man, I'm here. I mean commit to, to being involved, to being vulnerable. Like, like even if you're feeling that sense of like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of scared of I'm going to be judged. Or I'm scared I'm going to be rejected here. Or even I'm not feeling like this is worth it. Bring that into the group. Like, like let them know like, man, this is what I'm feeling tonight. And, and let them embrace you with the deep reality of Jesus' forgiveness when they say, hey, man, you're forgiven. We love you. Um, it's in these contexts where we really get to live out what we're talking about and really what reinforces what we're talking about. And so, yeah, friends, I love you. I, what I want to do right now as we close this time together is I want to pray for us. Uh, I want us uh, to, to pray to, to, uh, that the, the spirit in our hearts would, would allow us the ability to um, engage the word in a fruitful uh, way through the lens of the gospel. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and pray. We're going to jump into a song to respond to worship, and then I'll be back to close this up. Okay, would you pray with me? 
Father, thank you so much for your word. I ask that you would bless this time. Thank you for your word. I, I, I thank you, God, that when it confronts us, it confronts us not to remind us of where we failed, but rather to, to, to point us back to the glory and beauty of Jesus that we have forgiveness in, that we have restoration in. If anyone uh, hearing this does not know that forgiveness, that, that is sitting under the curse of Scripture when we read it, that they would, uh, that they would follow you, God. Uh, let us be a community that welcomes individuals uh, working through what it means to follow Jesus in. Bless us. Um, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
King of Kings, and we will sing, Holy, Holy is the King of Kings. Hey friends, uh, I just wanted to jump back in and say I love you. Um, this week I pray that the community groups would be extra encouraging, that we would value our time together, uh, that we would know that we are a people, right, that are called and loved by God, uh, that this is his family, and that we are, we have the unique and special opportunity to go out and invite others into this family as well. And so I love you. Have a blessed week. You are sent. God bless. We'll see you next week. Bye.